Good morning, everybody. First of all, I think you are not complete, but uh, perhaps the one or the other will join us uh, during the next, let's say, half an hour. Anyway, uh, Peter told you already, uh, we are representatives of the European Institute for Labour and Industrial Relations. Uh, both of us, uh, we are academics. That means we, uh, I, uh, Professor Fischer, he is still he will introduce himself in a second. And I'm the second because I'm retired. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but I accompanied uh, the former uh, projects uh, from uh, InnoSoc uh, and so on. So I was in the University of Applied Science in Leipzig, Telekom University, but now I'm retired. And uh, okay, it's my pleasure uh, to be active in this Erasmus project. And we will talk about uh, the engineers of the 21st century. So uh, the title has been changed a bit uh, from the agenda, but uh, we will talk about this and we see challenges, opportunities and risks. And you will see this is a real wide field. You are engineers or you're becoming engineers. And so we must find out, is it uh, just, uh, well, working on machines or what are the responsibilities? But first of all, Klaus, introduce yourself and then we start with it. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, hello and welcome from my side. My name is Klaus Fischer. Unfortunately, I'm not yet retired. As <laughs> <laughs> But it's really a pleasure to be here. So I don't have uh, the possibility uh, normally in my daily business uh, to travel a lot and uh, to, to meet uh, European students. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Professor for Sustainability Management at uh, Wilhelm Büchner Hochschule, which is also a University of Applied Science. It's not mine, huh? Located in Darmstadt. Yo, <laughs> 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 yes, it's, it's not uh, that from Kobitz. Um, it's uh, only the same name. And we are a distance um, education university, so teaching um, online and in distance learning formats, mainly for professional students. And maybe you uh, know the CLEPS group, so CLEPS, uh, where you have some publishing companies and also some other um, uh, education companies in Europe, and the BBH, where I'm located, um, is part of that group. Yeah, and um, we are glad to. Um, discuss and to introduce you into this topic. As was already mentioned, um, we will have, of course, a certain technological focus, but we also have a focus on rather future oriented and sustainability aspects. And um, we will also um, have, after presentation session, some group work together with you. So maybe um, until the group of the start, will be um, even a, uh, more students here. And yeah, we would like to discuss also the topic uh, engineering of the future together with you this morning. Okay, so we have a, 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 team, a teaching or a co-teaching uh, uh, format, we can say. That means we are doing it, uh, we share our responsibilities uh, during uh, the presentation. So I will start because I'm elder and, uh, and I'm still in fourth but class will continue and uh, but we will close uh, the presentation together. Okay, let's go. Um, otherwise, we lose a time. So you see, uh, that's our globe. And all of you know we uh, we have just one of these globes. And what we are doing all together, flying to uh, Valencia, doing this and this and this. Okay, this is a risk for our Earth. And I think everybody will agree with this. So, and if you if we just look to, an, uh, to one term of Earth over today, did everybody hear about this from the students? Who have already heard about the Earth over today? Did everybody hear about that? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. Great. Now you can read what it is for the others who have never been informed about this. And you see uh, on in July 21, uh, we have celebrated this. That means, second, it marks the date when humanity's demand for ecological resources and services in a given year exceeds that uh, what Earth can uh, regenerate this year. So, in Germany, 
We had it already in May. But on the global level, we will have it in July this year again. Why is the difference? Because in Germany, in the United States and other uh, developed countries, we are living above our opportunities. That means if everybody would live like we do, in, also in Spain and in your countries, we would need three globes, three uh, in India and in Africa, of course, it's less. And this is why on a global level, uh, the date is later than it is, for example, in Germany. Just uh, think about it. OK, we come to the agenda. Klaus will uh, yeah. introduce the agenda. As, as Lutz already mentioned, um, we'll talk about this topic. We'll talk about not only the Earth overshoot date, but the consequences of this day. Because um, when the global north is living beyond its opportunities and also on the coast of the global south, we have some problems of equity and of justice between the generations which are living on Earth now and in the future. You all know it, the discussion about climate change, for example. And uh, that's why we will also talk about sustainability, the global vision of sustainable development. Who of you already heard about the UN Sustainability Development Goals, SDGs? Okay, a couple of you, that's great. We also have a look on, on these uh, yeah. goals here in the first part. And after that, after the introduction, we will focus on your role and the role of engineering technologies in the future as a problem solver on the first hand, but also as um, maybe the cause of problems. Not only looking on the uh, overshoot day, but also on social justice and so on. And then we would like to introduce Three. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Three exemplary fields of action which are linked with digitization. And we also have a short look on some methodologies concerning the life cycle assessment, how to look, how to assess the impact the technology might have now and in the future. Yeah, and afterwards, the uh, third part will be our group work the exercise where you can think about your future role you will have and you would like to develop a certain profile of an engineer of the future. Okay, so uh, just to, uh, uh, to introduce you uh, with all uh, these problems. Uh, the first one, so I won't read uh, all the slides. I just wanted to pick out uh, the most important uh, information about that. Uh, Kalowitz uh, is a German uh, guy, uh, and he described uh, in 1713 uh, uh, already what uh, we are we develop uh, in the 300 years uh, from then. And you see, uh, Kalowitz already combined both economic thinking, that means if you cut a, a, a tree, you must uh, plant it every. Otherwise, the forests, like in China, for example, you have almost no more, uh, no more forests because uh, the whole forests have been cut. And this is why, of course, uh, from, the, uh, from the temperature, uh, it's uh, really a, a problem. And the economic, economic thinking and care for future generations. And you will see, we always meet the, this uh, term. That means we must live to leave something for the next generation. You are my next generation, or again, the second thing. Yeah? I'm grandpa, and you can imagine that for me it is extremely, it's extremely important uh, that my grandchildren and Klaus' children is the next generation for me. I could be his father. So uh, that we really, yeah, we must guarantee for the next generations uh, a more or less uh, good uh, life. So it's a yeah, sustainability today, and you see uh, behind this balancing economic, social, and ecological aspects for long-term viability, which means, again, the future, and of course, uh, this, uh, this, uh, yeah, uh, this holistic uh, approach uh, of sustainability. So what are the important milestones? And you see, it started a bit uh, in 1987. I remember this was my first trip to Africa. 
uh, where the uh, this uh, first uh, sentence development sustainable to ensure that it meets the needs of the present that means our life we are living uh, today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs this is the core information the core message we need in this field of sustainability we have uh, another coming uh, we had another uh, 1992 uh, famous uh, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. You can really do so. There's no need of uh, really explain everything. And you get, of course, all these uh, uh, presentations. Uh, so if you are interested, you can uh, reread it a, a bit uh, later. Hi, good morning. So we have again the uh, when we had in 2000 so-called millennium development goals uh, and with this millennium development goals the united nations started really to do something to improve to improve uh, the sustainable uh, development uh, on earth and uh, you will you see there's another uh, very important and we come back to this uh, today uh, several times we have in 2015 uh, the uh, the agenda 2030 with the 17 oh, oh, ah. did everybody see this picture already yeah i think you saw it but yeah. i wonder uh, whether you can explain what is behind that and our task today is a bit to let you know what from these 17 uh, uh, sustainable development goals are important for you in your future uh, profession. That's a bit uh, the idea behind what we are doing today with you. And you see uh, the United Nations uh, established this and we have, and this is important regular monitoring uh, uh, systems behind. And of course, everybody of us is touched by these SDGs. In our daily life, look to the governments around the world and of course the industry. That means this is an economic uh, approach which is extremely important. Whether you have uh, allies, whether you have chemical industry, if you have metal industry or something, of course you will find in these uh, 17 sustainable development goals more or less approaches to all of us, the private, uh, uh, the private person, the public, uh, the, uh, the governments, and of course industry. And this is very important because uh, most of us, you will work for industrial uh, uh, companies, and of course if you have responsibilities. Either you work for them or you do your own business. So it's your responsibility as well, but we come back to this later. So coming back from the from the globe to Europe to Europe. Did you hear about this? The European Green Deal? Uh, more or less. Yeah, so this is something you are in, uh, in the middle really of uh, this way coming to a climate neutrality. Uh, from 2050. So we have 2022, there are 28 uh, years, and you see this European Green Deal, we come back to this uh, later, is a, a core uh, aim, a core objective of the European uh, 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 policy. And you see uh, Madame von der Leyen, uh, she uh, announced it uh, some years ago in 2009, we must do something, and now all uh, partner countries in Europe, uh, they are asked really to do something in this field. So if you are interested, you really should uh, read a bit what is behind. But and some of these approaches, Klaus will uh, explain it to you. Look, maybe, maybe we could have a look on the uh, yes, speech. Of, she, she told that the Green Deal could be our man on moon moment. What, and why is the European Green Deal, or could it be the man on moon moment? Okay, 
Go on. What do you associate with uh, uh, yeah. to be man or moon, and why is it here in this context? Yeah. It's a, it's a small step for, for people and maybe companies, but it's a huge step for humanity. Yeah, okay, this could be the, the first thing. And from the, the European society and all of the economy, what would you think? Why is the Green Deal important? Is it only concerning the planetary boundaries and concerning uh, ecological aspects? Or how is it linked with um, growth, with uh, the competitiveness of our economy? So well, what von der Leyen meant is that if uh, the Europeans um, are ahead of developing sustainability technologies, for example, are, if they are ahead um, concerning the climate neutrality, then they will also be very competitive because um, the old technologies, the old industries will not uh, survive for the next decades yeah, concerning um, the raw materials which are or which will not be further accessible concerning the climate change, concerning planetary boundaries. So she did a little bit what also Karlowitz did. Yeah, she connected um, questions of justice, questions of ecological health with um, hard economic facts. And that's why they mentioned or she mentioned that this could be our man and moon moment in a international um, competition too. And this is Mark the Petir, the US as a global leader. Yeah, behind. Uh, just two more approaches uh, behind this, uh, the old, I say, old Horizon 2020, uh, which is replaced by the Horizon 20, uh, 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 sorry, Horizon Europe, uh, and the European Green topics. And you can read uh, what is behind that, and uh, Klaus will explain a bit uh, in detail some of these uh, approaches. And you see, it is everybody. It's uh, Secure energy, it's far to fall, that means agriculture, we have toxic free environment, and so on and so on. I think it's no need of uh, really reading everything, but you see everything which is behind this approach really to improve uh, Europe and our life. And this is the, uh, the, the actual the Horizon Europe, what I just mentioned, uh, which is uh, was started in 21 and will last until uh, 27. And you have, uh, they use key funding program for research and innovation. That's a bit what you are, uh, well, what's your, uh, uh, yeah, what's your job now? And you see the second one, uh, help to achieve the UN sustainable development goals. That's behind that. That means uh, what Klaus said, uh, Europe on the one hand, and of course uh, the global approach uh, on the other hand, uh, which is uh, behind. You want to add something? No, thank you. No? Okay. So, well, now I will add something. Now you will add something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So, as you have seen, um, there was a certain emergence of this idea of sustainable development, starting from Karlowitz and the quite um, yeah, easy task how to manage a forest sustainable or sustainably, um, to the questions how to manage our planet in these planetary boundaries. And um, we have also to mention, that's what Lutz also showed, that there's a lot of uh, money behind these ideas also. So the uh, politic is recognizing that we need a transformation now, and there's also a lot of funding in these fields, as you have, been, uh, as you have seen uh, concerning these European strategies. And that's why um, sustainability is not only a moral question, a normative question concerning the equity between global north and south, but it's a question, of course, of the general survival um, of humanity in these quite comfortable um, spheres. We have it until now, so we have a more or less functioning climate system, we have clean water and so on. So first of all, securing the, the uh, safeguard of humanity. And on the other hand, the transformation will cost a lot, but it is also um, related and associated with a lot of um, possibilities, opportunities. Yeah, and we will now have a look on the role of uh, engineering and the question whether engineers or in which way engineers could um, contribute to this sustainable sustainability transformation 
what will be the role, what are the, the tasks you might have, and also the question uh, which challenges and risks are coming along with that. We took uh, three examples from the field of um, ICT because um, we thought that uh, the most of you are related to IT technologies coming from the IT disciplines. Um, so I think that you uh, may already know the difference between these uh, general terms. Um, digitalization means coming from uh, analog information to a digital information. Uh, digitalization then means really to integrate this digitization into everybody's life. And here, when we talk about digital transformation, this means to um, open new advantages by digitalization. And also, this is not mentioned in the slide, uh, not only to come to new business concepts, but also to foster this sustainability transformation. So for example, when we talk about the dematerialization of our economy, I would like to um, talk about it later a bit. So coming from our quite linear system of economy to a more circular system, digitalization could um, be a key. So on this slide, you can find um, several ideas how uh, digitalization, when it is sustainable oriented, could contribute to the questions and the challenges that Lutz uh, showed you concerning the sustainable development goals. Um, so without digitalization, for example, smart grids, grids and the integration of renewable energies into our energy nets would not function. This would not be possible. Um, you can uh, go ahead with solutions concerning smart cities, um, smart societies, smart cities. That's a topic which uh, will Niels um, present to you afterwards in more detail. You can use it um, when you look at smart solutions for agriculture, so fertilizing crops and so on. And from all these uh, opportunities, we took some concrete examples now, which I would like to present you. And then afterwards, we will also have a look on the other side. So not only on the advantages of digitalization, but also on the risks coming along with uh, this sustainability perspective. First of all, I would like to ask you, so here are some uh, opportunities some chances of digitalization. When you heard about the sustainable development goals, when you heard about uh, the idea of sustainability, which could be risks of digitalization in this field? Do you have already any idea? Yeah. Well, we have the, the digital divide. So we have a huge yeah. group of the population that can't access, dig, can't access digital assets or use the um, software or uh, devices. Mm -hmm. And they can't access and the services behind those things. Absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, also, a question of justice um, between different parts of the society, a question of inclusion, for example. Um, and when we look about sustainability, we also talk about at least three dimensions. So the dimension of uh, ecology, of economy, and of social aspects. And what you are talking about is uh, located in the uh, dimension of um, social aspects and economic aspects. And you're looking at this. Uh, digital divide. Further examples, maybe looking at the ecological dimension. What could be a problem? The digital pollution. The pollution, yes, absolutely. And uh, when you think about pollution, what do you mean concretely? Well, the pollution that will be generated by, by the enormous amount of electronic devices. Yes, yeah. So we have a lot of e-waste. Maybe if you think about how many smartphones you already ordered in your life, and looks to talk about the different generations. Um, so a couple of decades ago, we ordered no smartphones, and now we are in a, a great acceleration, yeah, where the, the life cycles of these devices are quite short, and um, that's why we produce an enormous amount of waste. And if you have waste on the one hand, what do you need on the other hand? The resources, yeah, and there we have also the problem because we are living um, on a planet which has its boundaries. Yeah, we talked about the Earth overshoot day, and you've seen this uh, this Apple model of the of the Earth uh, at the first slide. Uh, so we only have this one planet. So we have 
both problems from the resource and also from the emissions and from the pollution, for example. Okay, yeah, great. So let's have a look, a short look at these uh, three examples. First of all, we just discussed it, uh, digitalization and circular economy. So how can digitalization uh, support to come from our linear economic model to a more circular economic model? Although uh, we have the problems of um, the uh, amount of um, resources you need to produce electronic devices and you have the problems of e-waste, for example. Um, so first of all, linear economy, that's what we already talked about. Uh, we use our raw materials uh, in a way as if we would have um, yeah, infinite resources in the most parts. So only around 40-50% uh, from the raw materials we use worldwide are coming from a certain recycling. That also means that more than 80% are only going through this linear process from raw material to disposal. And then you have the problems we already discussed. On the first hand, uh, we have some scarcity of resources. And on the other hand, we have the problems the disposals are producing in our ecological environment. For example, when you look at uh, the contamination of uh, with plastic, yeah, you, you find uh, all around the world. So this is on the first hand, when you look at the economic part, completely inefficient how we use our raw materials and it is also unsustainable um, because we have this uh, emissions, we have this disposal and we have these increasing problems um, concerning the waste we are producing. And this waste, it's not only um, hard stuff, <laughs> it's only, uh, it's also CO2 for example, yeah, so the, the greenhouse gases, CO2 and other greenhouse gases which contribute to global warming, um, which cause other problems, as you all know. Yeah, and our um, our supply chains we um, established globally in the last decades also provide some supply risks, a lot of ecological and social impacts, because we have supply chains where many of the high pollutive, pollutive steps of value creation are located to the global south. We are importing a lot of raw materials from uh, countries um, to, to have the consumption here in the northern part of the world. And uh, when you look at supply risks and uh, the current situation after Corona, now the situation in the Ukraine, you also see that, um, yeah, this is a high vulnerable system we established in the last decades. So what are the ideas? What could be some solutions um, concerning digitalization and circular economy? Yeah, when you look here at the different phases of the new creation, what do you think concerning the product and systems uh, or service design? How could digitalization help to come to a more, more secular economy, you have an idea. How it will be easier to, edu to educate people and by doing that. So I didn't get uh, Digitalization is going to make information more accessible yes. to people. Yeah. And by doing that, we, we are creating people that can offer us solutions for our problems. Mm -hmm. And they can offer specific solutions yeah. and you can also steer, that's what we will see on uh, the further slides, um, that you can also have production which is less on stock, it's more on demand. So this could be a contribution when you look at the dematerialization of our economy. So when you're talking about sharing economy, for example. Okay, um, you, you said information is the key, and it's really the key here, because um, we have a problem, for example, concerning the information about all the waste we produce and the disposals we have. Even if you want to recycle such a device here, you often do not really know um, what is inside. So um, we have here plastic. Is it uh, pure plastic or is it a combination? Is it mixed material? 
and it's a mixed material, you can often not recycle it. You do not know if um, you are not using it, are you not using it because you don't like it anymore, or is it really technologically at the end of life? Yeah. And there are some ideas um, to track products, to track the life cycle of products, also to track the disposal we have, um, just to give the information for circular economy solutions, um, how to recycle or how to remanufacture maybe such a device here before you're putting it um, to the waste. And this means that you need to combine these physical products with um, yeah, smart solutions with the internet. So you have uh, the idea of Internet of Things or of cyber physical systems. You need to combine the hardware with some sensors and together with software. So here you are the experts, not me. Um, but just to give you an idea how um, this could function. Other important technology here is the blockchain technology, mainly when you're talking about um, sustainability relevant information, you need to share along the value creation chain, along the supply chains, um, respecting, for example, the protection of trade secrets, um, then you can use blockchain technology. Or if you want to be sure that the information um, about uh, the production conditions of a product um, cannot be manipulated, you can also use blockchain technology. Centering, I think it's a part of the other solutions you choose, so you can generate real-time data on the base, on the location, on the composition, and so on, which is necessary to really reuse or to remanufacture or to recycle afterwards, um, to material recycling um, your products at the end of the life cycle. And for that, you also need some market platforms or logistic platforms, so uh, Uber for waste to know um, who is now, or who needs now, maybe a component of this device here to produce a new one, um, or who would buy a certain amount, some tons of uh, plastic components to use it for its production. And therefore you need this information sharing, what you, what you already said, um, and you can create these platforms to automize the information transfer and also to, to generate a marketplace for waste. Some ideas um, here, think recycle feedback system. Um, I think all of you know the RFID technology and how such an RFID chip looks like. And here, for example, this is used in a pilot project um, just to give information about the materials which are used in uh, here. It's a, it's a bottle, yeah, and how you should really separate the waste in the correct way um, to allow that the components are afterwards recycled. And not a downcycling, but a real material recycling, for example. Or here another idea, also a, um, a pilot project concerning the question of how we could reduce the waste uh, coming from these to go cups and there. Uh, McDonald's and Starbucks um, supported such a project where they um, used reusable to-go cups and they put sensors on them just to understand how the flows are of these cups. So which collection station do you need? Um, what is the travel? What is the journey, the customer journey of such a cup and so on? Because of course, if you produce uh, um, a cup which you can use further, um, this has a certain value and that's why it's important to understand um, how it goes and where, the, um, where it is. Okay, other topic, uh, but you see that they are closely related, is sharing economy and presumption. Do you know what presumption is? So it's a word which is combined from production and consumption. So if you have uh, the rule that you are a producer and a consumer on the same time, then you are a prosumer. Who of you or your parents have a photovoltaic on the roof? Um, uh, solar power, yes. 
Yeah, yeah solar panels. Okay. On the roof. On the roof. No, we don't have that, but most of our. But you, you know the. Yeah. Yeah. So then you are a prosumer, yeah, because you're producing energy and you're consuming at least a part of the energy you, you produce. Or if you have a storage system, you can really consume all. And this leads to a certain decentralization of um, radio creation, not only in the energy system, but also in, in other and parts. And you sell it. And you sell it, of course. Sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is back right to the providers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 not only, yeah, to the providers who can uh, again distribute it. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. So a part of it you will use directly, yeah. and the other part um, you will sell. So then you are already a consumer, just to uh, be clear concerning the idea. Okay, sharing economy, the, the idea is um, that normally we are using things and um, yeah, if you think about car sharing, uh, I think the, the normal car is standing for 23 hours in a parking slot. So you use it around 40 minutes, I think, each day. Yeah, it depends of course of your personal behavior, but uh, on average you use your car for 40 minutes. And for this 40 minutes, it's really a very, very expensive solution for individual mobility. Yeah, you need the space, you need the resources, you need to put the money into the car, and you use it only for 40 minutes. Or um, if you're looking at some uh, tools for for handcraft, <laughs> um, so uh, you say that for the whole life, a normal private person is using. Do you know the word for bohr bohr machine? Uh, to get some drilling machine. Drilling, drilling, machine. drilling machine, yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think uh, is the average use time of a drilling machine, private drilling machine, um, for the whole lifetime of this tool? What do you think? How long is it? 15 minutes. Yeah, it's, really, it's about <laughs> between 15 and 30 minutes. You use a drilling machine, and after five years, it's, it's uh, Effect, or you would like to have the next one, yeah. So it's really uh, crazy, and this is the idea of sharing economy. Yeah, we have sharing economy when you use car sharing, for example. And if you have ever used car sharing, you know that without digitization, you cannot have car sharing because you know you have to locate the car, you have to um, identify yourself, and so on and so on. Yeah. In, in the farming, in farming, yeah, farmers, they do it. With their machines. Yeah, because yeah. they're too expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you also know Hilti, maybe, the brand. Yeah. Yeah. And they really yeah. developed from a producer um, of these tools to a sharing platform more and more. Yeah. They really changed their complete business model behind and um, they produce high value products, which are quite expensive. And that's why they, you have a leasing or you have a contracting. Yeah. Okay. This is the one part of the idea. The other part is that you can use swarm intelligence and that you can use crowd work. So you have big tasks and you can divide these big tasks into very small tasks and you can uh, invite, I would say, the whole World Wide Web to participate in a project, for example. No? Not only crowdfunding, but also crowd work. We have to look on that later. And this is, uh, of course, an enormous opportunity to dematerialize our economy. Sharing. The other example here, presumption, we already talked about uh, concerning the uh, solar panels, um, but this is also possible in a more material way. So here, um, if you are looking at this vacuum cleaner, and uh, you have a vacuum cleaner which is about uh, 10 years old and it's great, you can use it, but now um, some part is breaking. Yeah? What are you doing with the vacuum cleaner when it's 10 years old and one part is breaking? Normally, to be honest, yeah, you throw it away. It looks <laughs> because you don't have the possibility to get any spare parts for that thing. Yeah, it's old. Yeah, it's ten years old now. Maybe the technologic life cycle could be twenty years, but you have um, to put it to the waste because one spare part is missing. Yeah. So, yeah. Just one example: our wash machine didn't work because the door uh, we couldn't open the door. To pay a door yeah. was about half the price of a new machine. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Absolutely, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And this is also the idea behind to say, um, of course, you cannot do that for every technological solution. And I was quite skeptic as I heard the first time about it, but uh, there are uh, already a lot of solutions where you can use it um, with additive manufacturing, 3D printing of spare parts. 
So it is not necessary that you have this 3D printer at your house. You can also have a 3D printer hub in your village, maybe, or in your city. And you can get information from the producer of your vacuum cleaner, um, which is now 10 years old, and then your spare parts can be printed. And you have what you already mentioned, um, a very good fit between what you need and what you produce. And it's not necessary to um, have a great stock of spare parts in the industry. Uh, so it's very um, intelligent, very efficient solution. That's why these products can also be cheaper. Than. Okay, so demand-oriented production, decentralized education in a very different uh, context from the solar panel up to the spare part printing. The last uh, example, and it's also already a bridge to the topic which uh, Niels will, will present afterwards, it's the precision farming, the smart farming. So normally if you are a farmer and you would like to fertilize um, your, your culture, you will do it for the, the whole um, area, yeah? But maybe the conditions at one part of the agricultural area is different than 400 meters away. And this is uh, relevant for fertilization, it's relevant for pest controls, for insecticides and um, other things. And it's also relevant for water, yeah? And uh, this is a bridge to, to news, smart watering, he, he will tell you uh, more about that. So you have an irrigation and smart irrigation management. You also have uh, harvest timing analysis. So the software can tell you when the optimal time is, has come to harvest. Um, you have livestock control if you have animals and so on. And there you need, again, these uh, Internet of Things, IO2 technology with uh, different uh, sensor schedules and so on. And there are um, yeah, a couple of solutions uh, starting from automatically driving uh, machines, agricultural machines. Um, and so on, which you can use here to get this um, agricultural products or production more efficient and more intelligent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just for those who are interested in uh, smart farming, if you look uh, to, the, uh, to the to other uh, projects we had in the Erasmus, there is one presentation about uh, smart farming which could be interesting for you as well. Okay. Yeah, good advice. Yeah. I, uh, I have a question. How do farmers, I assume that you already mm -hmm. spoken to a couple of farmers or at least heard about their opinion. What is their opinion about that? Because my father, uh, he, he is not a gardener, but he, he like, uh, uh, manages snakes and uh, plants irrigation systems, but for uh, smaller gardens and farmers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he also tries to uh, install uh, more modern uh, uh, like, like control units for the irrigation systems. The newer ones use Wi Fi, and uh, you also can monitor like, mm -hmm. uh, like the humidity, the <laughs> amount of rain. Wait. He yeah. will explain it to you later. Yeah. Okay. This is his task. <laughs> okay, I just <laughs> wanted to, question. to say in the end that uh, that we always measure everything and, uh, and program everything to be perfect for the yeah. loan, for yeah. the garden. Yeah. And people are always just overwrite it. And I see that I have to uh, water like twice as much that you program that. Yeah. And, and in the end, the, the, the plants always die. <laughs> but they just don't care about our opinion. And professionalism. <laughs> so I just wanted to know the farmer's opinion. Because, okay, sorry. I think that you have um, uh, both both parts, both uh, perspectives. Of course, we are now just only showing the opportunities. Yeah? We have okay. a lot of look on the challenges. Okay, okay. But um, yeah, what does it mean for a farmer? Um, normally, you're a farmer and you 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 have the know-how how to harvest. Yeah, and you have a look on your area and then you you feel it. I would say. And now a software solution or hardware solution is coming and says you have to harvest now. Yeah, it's really an acceptance problem. Yeah. Um, I think you, you cannot really, or you shouldn't use these technologies to substitute the experience and the know-how of the farmer. Mm -hmm. But you can edit and you can, um, yeah, 
develop it and uh, get it a little bit uh, smarter, maybe. Um, but I also think that many of these solutions are also some kind of over engineering. Yeah, so you are solving problems um, which you solve with your personal uh, know-how and intelligence, and you're solving it with a quite huge amount of electronic waste and so on. Yeah, so this is only yeah, now to, to show the opportunities. <laughs> And other farming projects, because you already mentioned the Erasmus projects, um, Lassie, you will know it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully by now. I Hopefully by now. <laughs> so we, you will hear the presentation of our group uh, next week. Um, it's also in other farming contexts. So um, smart insect farming, for example. Uh, insects are a very sustainable producer of high value protein and high value unsaturated <laughs> fat and so on. So Lassie will tell you all that next week. Uh, <laughs> in detail, in detail. <laughs> and um, yeah, our group, this case study um, we supervised, our group developed a solution also for using um, artificial intelligence and image recognition to uh, support the, the questions and the challenges you have when you uh, are an insect farmer. Because here, this is a near people, maybe you all know it, uh, in this um, phase, yeah. The, the so-called mealworm, yeah? and uh, there are some challenges concerning the different uh, life phases of these swarms and so on, of these new species. Okay, so but just um, um, advice for the next case by next week. Okay, well, we talked about the opportunities, and it all looks so good, it's so smart, it's so intelligent, and it's so IoT, yeah, but uh, of course you also have to think about the opposites, and um, that's why it is in uh, important to look at the methods of technology assessment, because each technology you have and you use have some desired impacts, and it has also impacts you intend and which are predictable, but there are also technology impacts which are non-desired, unintended, or unpredictable. Do you have some examples for me concerning technologies which have desired, intended, and predictable impacts, and on the other hand, also, for example, unpredictable impacts. Do you have any idea? Yeah, that's it. Well, the de developing artificial intelligence yeah. is kind of unpredictable in the long run. Yes, that's yeah. absolutely. Okay. Artificial intelligence, other uh, technologies? Also, we have here the um, example of uh, nuclear power, yeah, which is also controversial, debated concerning the intended and the desired impacts and the unintended, mainly when we look at climate protection. Yeah, so the one expert say, uh, oh, it's a almost CO2 neutral possibility to generate electricity, and the other part say, <laughs> Just look not only on energy production, look on the whole life cycle of the technology and all uh, the risks which are coming along. So it really depends, and that's what I wanted to show you here, on the point of view and on the, the system you are looking at. Yeah? If you are have your, your electronic vehicle and you say it is not producing any CO2, so we have a CO2 neutral mobility, then this only works if you look at the use phase when uh, the car is driving only this very small part of the whole life cycle. When you look at the production, for example, or at the non-solved uh, recycling of your um, echoes and so on, then you have another assessment of this technology, only looking on one indicator, only looking on the CO2 or the GHG relevance. Yeah? So we have different um, assessment tools here, and it's necessary to look always on the possibilities, always on the challenges or the risks that technology is coming along. You had a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask if the solar panels also can be listed here because the, the number of them is growing so fast. Yeah. I'm not really an expert in the, in the territory, but, but the, these, are, these panels are kind of new technology like they developed in the last 15 years maybe and the, the, long years. yeah and the, oh, at least they started to uh, approach the normal people in the last yes. uh, 
that, but uh, it is yet to know their life cycle and how and after what will happen to them. Yeah. So, so very good example. Um, the, the solar technology, solar power technology, um, in the first years of the development, you really have to um, bring a lot of energy into the production and uh, the, the, the impact concerning the whole life cycle, so the amount of energy which will be produced was quite uncertain. Now we know that um, looking at the, the energy you have to put into, um, you have a very, very positive balance. Yeah, because the life cycle is uh, more than 20 years. Yeah. Uh, after 20 years, uh, it's a little bit going down the power, but you can still produce energy. But of course, you have the question of the raw materials and what is at the end of the life cycle. Yeah, these questions are not really answered by now. But it's also a good example because um, you you see then that it depends on uh, if a technology is newly introduced. So maybe like the um, e-vehicles now, or um, if you are looking at further steps when it's more, um, yeah, if you have more experience. Yeah. Okay. Do you know um, the life cycle assessment and uh, ISO 1440? Have you ever heard about that? Okay. So this is the, the classical method to come to an eco life cycle assessment. And as I already mentioned, looking to e-vehicles, it really depends on what you are looking, which technological system you are looking at. And um, this uh, life cycle assessment is only focusing on ecological aspects. So you have indicators as, for example, the CO2 emissions, the climate warming potential or you have um, indicators looking at the biodiversity consequences that technology may have and so on. When we talk about sustainability, why is it not enough only to focus on environmental things? Which other things would we need to look at? So we also need to look at the social impacts, for example, as you mentioned, concerning the digital divide. Yeah? And that's why you have done developments and uh, yeah, it's quite new. It's about um, 15 to 20 years old um, to say that you have to, to go from an ecological life cycle assessment to a more integrated social life cycle assessment. And this was also driven by the UN, United Nations Environmental Program. And here you are additionally focusing on social and economic impacts of a certain technology. And of course, this is making the assessment much more complex. Uh, it's not really easy because you cannot measure, as in the case of GHG um, warming potential, you cannot measure, for example, the emissions of a certain greenhouse gas, so for, for CO2, for example if you also want to have a look on social impacts. You need other indicators, you need rather qualitative um, ideas, and uh, you cannot really measure it in such an easy way. Well, let's have a look. Um, here you have an example of a social life cycle assessment of a t-shirt, and what you see here is uh, only the system boundaries. So um, here, go and scope definition. When you're talking about a t-shirt, it's not a quite complex product, of course. You also need to think about which phase of the life cycle is now relevant. So maybe you know some label, um, which are only, Johnny say, that there are not any toxic substances in your t-shirt. So you can wear it directly on your skin without any problem, any hair problem. Yeah? But this label only looks if the chemicals are no more there when you buy your your t-shirt. It does not look which chemicals were used in the production phase. Yeah? So you see with this very, very small example, um, the label of a t-shirt and the production of a t-shirt that uh, such a life cycle assessment is really quite complex. Okay, so you have it on your slides. I don't want to go into detail here. I just wanted to show how complex this could be. And um, I wanted to show one 
um, impact category, which is measured when you look at a social life cycle assessment, so not looking on greenhouse gas emissions, for example, you see the impact category of working conditions. And there we are again at the SDG agenda, because on your SDG agenda, you have one goal, and there's the word decent work. Decent work means that you earn enough money, um, that you are paid fair, but also that when you are working, you do not get any damages physically, but also mentally. Yeah? So burnout, for example, is not in the decent work agenda. Um, and this decent work is, of course, relevant when we look at our very cheap clothes you can buy, which are produced, for example, in Bangladesh and so on. You heard about it. Yeah? But how to work, uh, how to measure good working conditions? If I will ask you, do you have good working conditions? We are around 20 people here. I think I will get uh, 20 different answers. Yeah? So you have to find indicators to measure that, which are also internationally, um, or which, which can be measured internationally. And here we have, first of all, to break down this um, impact category working conditions to some subcategories, so social security and benefits, fair salary, the amount of working hours, and the health and safety standards. And then you can go to concrete indicators which you can really measure. So the indicator for social security and benefits are the, the number of employees or the, the share of employees which is covered by a health insurance, which is not um, uh, not 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 uh, the usual case, for example, in um, developing countries. The number of employees which are covered by any retirement insurance, and so on and so on. And here, with this small example, you see that even only looking at such a quite less complex product as a T-shirt um, from a sustainability uh, assessment could be a quite complex task. We both, we both started that you're right. Okay, we also talked, we already talked about that you have uh, some positive technology impacts, but you also have some uh, negative uh, technological impacts and risks. Um, coming back again to digitalization, yeah, back from future to digitalization, you have, for example, here uh, platforms for the crowd work we already talked about, crowd and click work. So maybe you know Amazon Mechanical Turk. Have you heard about it before? Well, it's a global platform where, this is a original picture, we have access to a global on-demand market for 24-7 um, workforce. Sounds great, 24-7 yeah? marketplace globally. Yeah? And this is also from the original Amazon uh, website taken here. Amazon Mechanical Turk is crowdsourcing marketplace that makes it easier for individuals and businesses to outsource their processes and jobs to a distributed workforce who can perform these tasks virtually. So great or not. Which risks do you see when you look at such a platform? If you want to offer your workforce here, if you want to make some data assessment, if you want to train on artificial intelligence, then you can do it in the evening and you can uh, get access here. And what could be the risks? Do you know how much less working regulation? Yes, yeah, absolutely. For safety of the employees. Yes, yeah. So the whole development we had in the last decades concerning the right of workers does not work here anymore. We have a completely unlimited or unregulated uh, market. Yeah? And you also find it here. Traditionally, tasks like this have been accomplished by hiring a large temporary workforce, which is time consuming, expensive, and difficult to scale. Yeah? So you know the idea behind. So this is uh, mechanical talk. Now one is uh, click workers. And there you have also your virtual workforce on demand worldwide. So you have also the opposite side of this technology, of this uh, sharing economy, this crowdsourcing solution. Well, we talked about that there is no legal framework. Another point is also the questions, what are you doing at such a platform? So you have a lot of digital employees which are not really employed, 
that are earning the money with that. They need to earn that, and they are doing micro tasks because you have quite complex tasks, for, for example, in project management, and you are only selling one very, very small part of your workforce, for example, doing all based the same data analysis and to put it here um, to this whole question. The payments are not always sure and you often have uh, the first come, first serve rule. That also means that it could be possible, just imagine that um, there's a task to develop a logo uh, for a company or for a certain product and you will um, design the logo, will work one hour or uh, one week for that, and then you put it um, on the platform and afterwards there's a competitive selection and uh, maybe 100 person offer the logo uh, and only one person is paid. Yeah? The other 99 worked for one week for free. So it's really a problem concerning the social security, concerning working conditions and so on. And um, as already taught you, uh, uh, you also this microtasking, so dividing the, the more complex tasks into very, very small steps. This is again a picture from the Click Workers uh, website. It really means that you come back to Taylorism and you have a new digital Taylorism. Do you know what is meant with that? Yeah? Could you explain it? Please? The algorithm is when on the project chain, project tool chain, the tasks are already divided into the tasks. Yeah. Very repetitive. Very repetitive. Very repetitive yes. and uh, not mentally stable. It's difficult to do it mentally uh, all day long. Yes. And so I think the digital terrorism is for the same as with digital tasks. For the new needs of uh, data Yeah. And where's the problem? Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't need maybe special um, uh, skills. Yeah. So the workers can be replaced uh, as here with such a platform. Yeah. And they can be uh, replaced very easily, so they can uh, they can add so much. Um, demands uh, for uh, in front of their employers. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So the same problems you had at the beginning of mass production, when as a worker in such a production line, did the whole day the same task yeah, physically, you have the problem now here when you're talking about these digital micro tasks. I think it's even a little bit severe because you are you're not integrated into a social system, into an enterprise. You're doing that at home, for example. And after two years of Corona, you know what it means to be completely on your own and uh, not to be really linked to a social system, not to have colleagues and so on. Okay. Well, another point of view uh, is um, we talked about information, we talked about data. Is it my side? Okay. <laughs> Only question. <laughs> Listen, the question uh, how does the use which is collected, uh, for which uh, for which purpose is it used, who benefits from it, and so on. You all know about the debate here concerning data security and uh, the rights. Uh, to, to invest and to, to discuss um, about digitalization sustainability. And here we are again, uh, back to the question, the future engineer, of course, you can develop a lot of technological brilliant solutions, yeah? but you always have to think about um, who will work with these solutions, what can be done with the solutions, what will be the consequences for the environmental systems, for social systems, for the humans which are working with that. And that's why you need, and this is also the introduction to the group work we will now have. Um, when you are developing and working on technological solutions, always um, you have to take into account the needs of the society, the needs of the individuals, which may have contact with your technology as workers, as consumers, and so on. And of course, what we uh, talked about, the limitedness of natural resources, and the problematic planetary boundaries we have. 
Yeah. Okay. Without this slide, something. So, first of all, Klaus, thank you very much. I think everybody he can go in detail. I'm a lawyer by profession, so I uh, was uh, very eager to understand what he was presenting. But I think uh, also because of my age, I think I would like to add some uh, critical remarks in the end. So, we were talking about the green, European Green Deal. We presented you the Horizon uh, Europe program. And of course, uh, the SDGs. You will work on the SDGs uh, in our working groups. We will uh, present to you after uh, a break. So I think if you look uh, to the actual situation we have on our globe, I think we all agree that all these uh, very uh, which are formulated in the SDGs, Deal. in the horizon, in the research uh, horizon Europe uh, program. They are, let's say, uh, in a bad condition because the world doesn't develop like it was 10 years ago. This is the one point. The other point, uh, I come back to the Green Deal and to the solar panels. Uh, I have the idea. So, uh, your reaction when Klaus uh, presented uh, the solar uh, panel uh, point was yes, you know it, but I wonder what countries you are coming from, this is really developed. So you see, uh, you know perhaps a bit the discussion about uh, the two uh, speed development in Europe. And it's a risk. If we go to the war in Ukraine just now, and if you see what is going on in Poland with the coal, yeah, we want uh, to re reduce uh, uh, coal production and we want to go to solar energy. So everything is, uh, well, outside our real uh, development. And I just want, uh, yeah, I, thought, I said this is because of my age. Uh, this is something which is very important for me and it should be important for you as well. On the other hand, on one hand, you are coming from uh, countries in Europe very uh, dif uh, differently developed already. On the other hand, of course, Europe gives a, has a platform on which the development should be on 127 level, 27 country level. But on the other hand, the external uh, the external di dimension, what is going on, is so dramatic that, of course, that's what we, uh, uh, what, and, and uh, first of all, Klaus presented to you. Uh, well, it's, it's not in line in uh, the planning which was uh, previewed some years ago. And this is, okay, of course, and I think when we are talking about the engineer of the 21st century, you, your generation, must find new solution uh, to meet uh, these challenges from outside. Sorry for uh, telling you this, but uh, it's important for me to bring this uh, to uh, your community. I think this is half past end, so we are exactly we are on time. in time. We are <laughs> on time, even you were some minutes too late. Uh, we talked a bit uh, faster. Okay, that's okay. So we have. Uh, how many minutes did we preview, Klaus? Oh, we, have, uh, or we would like to work with four groups with you. So mm -hmm. the work is starting now for you. Yeah. <laughs> you prepared, um, yeah. a couple of, of future vision. a couple of questions. Yeah. And the idea is that you are working uh, on two questions. I will present them. Uh, in each group. Are we around 20? 20, 20. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And um, you can prepare, or you should prepare, a small poster with your ideas to you develop in your group. Um, you will come here back, you can stay in this room, you can go outside wherever you want. We have, uh, first of all, some markers you can use, which you can um, have some different colors. And we will also work uh, in a sustainable way. Yeah. 
Um, and we were excited on your business model canvas. So <laughs> you can use this as a poster. Yeah? Um, if you want to make a draft first, you can use these sheets here. And afterwards, you can put your posters here. And um, yeah, I think we have 30 minutes. You can have a small break. Of course, maybe you do not need 30 minutes for um, answering the questions. And uh, we introduce the question to you. We would like to build the groups. Or not, we can do it in the other way. I will present the, the questions and then we can build the groups. Uh, groups and these groups are working with the same questions. So group one and two, the SDGs you presented, you all have your mobile phones, your smartphones, if you want to have a look on slides, and you can also find the, question, the, the SDGs again. And your first question will be, which SDGs are relevant for future seniors? What do you think? Yeah? Is it only a certain amount of these SDGs or however? So please select here three or four um, relevant examples and make your choice. And if these are only the goals, we also want to know which engineering solutions do you have in mind, also future solutions, to address these goals. Yeah? Okay, now it's over. <laughs> Um, so this will be the, the questions for uh, yeah. okay. one and two. And for the other group, for the other groups, group three and four, we are thinking not on the objectives of the political objectives and of the uh, engineering tasks, we are rather looking on the skills and the responsibility you may have as future engineers. So you really need the skills to understand the sustainability idea to develop and to accept technology um, respecting sustainability and um, which you might need as an engineer future. Yeah, yeah just to that, but what is the scope of like future engineers who is considered a future engineer? In general, you are all future engineers no, here, yeah, because you are okay. you okay. you're okay. You're okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The time scales, yeah, what do you mean the future or the what's your question? No, 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 it, uh, I got the answer, thank you. Okay. So this um quite almost lot of perspective and uh, the time perspective is if you ask as an engineer and engineers in the future, what are the tools you need and what is the special responsibility which your work, your professional life uh, will become a lot. Okay. So we have some great poster results, I think. Group one and two are here. Yes. Group four. Four is here. Okay, four is here. And group three is also here. Are there more? Oh, perfect. Thank yes. you. This is the new generation of engineers of the 21st century. <laughs> Well, okay, so let's start with uh, the results of group one and two. The question were, uh, you should have a look at the SDGs and choose the SDGs which you meant are the most relevant, or at least three to four SDGs, and to explain it. And also, um, yeah, find some examples and things which can be solutions to be developed. Who will present group number one? Right, do the first one. Okay. 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 So we have for the first SDG we chose affordable and clean energy. So we know that we are using a lot of like carbon fuel, fossil fuel to, to get energy and because it is a our limited resource, it's inevitable that at some point we're going to run out of it. So that's why we chose it. Mm -hmm. And we we chose for solutions like local re renewable energy, for example, if a city is, is by a creek or something like that, it can make use of the water power or something like that. And 
we have reusing energy, for example, if you have mining rigs, they mining rigs, they, they generate a lot of heat, and then you can use, use that heat to heat something else. So you're using you're using energy. And we also have fusion, I don't know how much you know about it, but it's supposed to be really good. Yeah. <laughs> when it works, yeah. <laughs> well, we're not quite there yet, but yeah. in a few years when maybe one of us gets into it, it we will do something good. Okay, okay, so last year doing the second one. Uh, Thank you very much. So, what we're almost there. <laughs> Just got a little closer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we had industry innovation. <laughs> this was a bit of a complicated one because it, since it does not have any adjectives in it, but like we thought about, you know, more like these general goals like uh, from the government, like putting money to education and uh, I guess there's like huge amount of stuff that could go here. Like infrastructure is really big thing, and you know, I, I think like developing uh, sustainably infrastructures to let's say Africa, places that there is really limited infrastructure right now compared to Europe, is really important too. So R and D regarding to sustainably developing these infrastructures, and, and yeah, well the same goes like adding funds also to innovation same way like infrastructure how you develop infrastructure sustainably is also about innovation a lot and industry is also very related to this like infrastructure thing so yeah i don't know if there's much else into it but that's all right thank you. yeah thank you okay thank you <laughs> so first, uh, sustainable cities and communities, we had some a few ideas like shared transportation, whether it be carpooling or improved uh, public transportation system. Uh, obviously, waste management is like uh, not the greatest thing all, all around the globe, so we could do uh, many, many things, uh, smart solutions uh, there. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, for the housing, uh, we, we have like a lot of housing uh, problems and things. So uh, we we were thinking of like multi-family units and like but in, in a sustainable, not the uh, original Soviet era, just like build like one block and, and that's it. Like something like well, like sustainable that keeps people happy because uh, that's like I think that's like one major key thing. Uh, to, to have a sustainable thing and yeah, more for us it's the natural air conditioner. So um, cities are kind of built around cars right now and okay, Valencia is a, is a great example because uh, we, you have that like they have so many parts here and uh, I think it just the uh, general atmosphere is different like the whole vibe. So uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Group four. So we decided to put the future engineer skills like uh, zero engineering, zero waste engineering. I think we think that it's uh, really important and it uh, shouldn't be really hard to accomplish. It uh, means uh, an engineer should know what uh, type of uh, materials they should use, so it will be 100% recyclable or at least uh, convergating to zero. So it's all, of course it's not uh, possible for every type of things to develop without waste, but that would be the main goal, one of them, and that, that should be a skill to know. And uh, we don't need to actually reinvent the wheel. Like, uh, because actually they have this repairability, like my father still use a drilling machine which was made in the Soviet Union. It's not like he cannot buy another one, he bought another one, a new one, but it cannot be repaired. So he had to repair that, that whole yeah. one. So, so it was before developed. It was how the engineering came out of the blue, so you had to develop something which is good, which can be repaired. Just sample the use of the And yeah, for example, the innovation, like problem solving, it's a uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, new technologies for uh, faster. And 
and then part one, but now in that flexibility, it also goes for the, the same way. And yeah, awareness that it's uh, about the mindset of uh, the new engineers. That they should be an activist in their field. They should go for the better with better development in uh, zero waste. So we should have that mindset in our everyday life. Yeah, and as we well, it's really important to understand what uh, these products are doing in the environment. So we have to develop things which are morally acceptable. And yeah, um, there is the risk. It's really important to, to grow up there. So if we, as engineers, develop crazy things as well, which has some limitations. And this can be adopted by the, the designer. So that's, that would be one of the main goals, to be morally responsible. Okay, so we had now an impression from the first question um, concerning the SDGs, and we now have an impression concerning the engineering skills and the responsibility which is coming along with that. Many thanks. Um, I think it would be good if you could continue and then we can also see the differences maybe. So, for our future engineer, we make a little CD. Ah, great. Um, and, uh, he has knowledge of sustainable materials, as it's really important for the future we use more and more sustainable materials in order to like reuse and recycle. Uh, security awareness, adaptive to change, team player, and leadership skills. These are all things that we find important uh, for someone that will model our future. Um, and his responsibility is to care for the uh, usage of materials, find environmentally friendly long term solutions, and create usable and recyclable products. Uh, and as you can see, we'll let this part of the video is empty, and it's because it's all of you. Good idea. Uh, just one uh, one question. Uh, your education in your universities, uh, do they follow your ideas? Our university? Well, we're yeah. all. You are, you are coming from, from a different yeah. universities. Yes. yes. Is your education yes. following? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and how? Yes. Yes. No. No. Are the professors prepared uh, to give you this kind of education? From the sustainable uh, point of view, it depends on the professor. Yes, of course, <laughs> it always does. <laughs> I think it's like an ongoing process, but they're going towards it, which is the main objective. And as long okay. as people are trying to go in the right way, that should be encouraged. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. I can't believe that. I mean, I'm sorry, I will cut you, but uh, for example, I think all of us are coming from informatics university. You need that students, right? No. Or business. Okay. No, no. Uh, just for you need that students. We are coming from informatics, all of us. Yeah. Okay. So the faculty of informatics is mostly about like informatics, but not that much of like. For example, there is a faculty of engineering, uh, not the one that uh, let's say took ahead this project. Mm -hmm. so, if you, I mean, from this point of view, I would say you would understand the, 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 the you know, like, um, again, point of view, I would say, uh, to, to this kind of projects. I mean, it's uh, the only informatics student thought about it to be part of this kind of project. But most of the engineering, engineering students, I would say, or the engineering itself, don't really like go within these projects as much as they go through the technical projects, mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't know, automation or like, I don't know, like yeah, this yeah. kind of project which works for robotics or stuff like this. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so they are rather specialized on the technology. Yeah. Solutions. They don't go through it. Yeah, so it's great to have you here that you are thinking uh, across the discipline, because it is necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have further questions for the groups who are already presented? So then one group is left. Second, Second one. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Good number two. <laughs> So what you developed with the factory cluster and especially the points uh, that one um, company is using the waste of the other or the, the energy which is uh, too much for one process, you can use it in the other process. Um, it's also called industrial ecology. Uh, so the symbiosis between different industrial systems is called industrial um, ecology. And um, I really found it very interesting because um, you have shown all these arrows. So you see that uh, the SDGs, they are not um, isolated from each other. They are highly interlinked and you cannot really um, contribute to one SDG and not to another. Yeah? Because we have these multi-dimensional problems, yeah? the wicked problems. And you also mentioned um, the responsibility in your presentation. Yeah? So we have also the link to groups uh, three and four. So the tasks are the one and the objectives, but the responsibilities and the skills you need are, of course, uh, the, the necessary other part for that. So thank you very much. It was very impressive to see you working. So motivated, <laughs> all of you. It was really great. And we also have uh, quite fancy posters. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. In the end, uh, I'm very active in Africa. And uh, three years ago, 
uh, I had the chance uh, to uh, organize a seminar in Cameroon, in Douala, in Cameroon, in, in the, the Douala Institute of Technology. And there was one professor, and uh, he was he studied in Germany because Cameroon, in the former times, uh, was a socialist country. And he had one sentence, and I will never forget this. We were talking about the engineer of the 21st century as well. And he said, look, the engineer in Africa, no, the uh, engineer in, uh, in the Western world, in the uh, industrial world, he invents things. But we in Africa, the engineer, we repair them. Mm -hmm. And th I was very impressed, and you must think that over. And that's exactly what we're, uh, <laughs> we're talking about. Or thinking about what we heard this morning, and this is if you uh, have ever uh, go to Africa, to not to Morocco and Algeria, but really to Africa, and then you see, uh, you will, uh, Peter will show you uh, at the next Tuesday a bit the Democratic Republic uh, of Congo, and uh, I will give you some explanations about this country uh, next Tuesday. But if you see, I delivered 60 bicycles to, uh, uh, to a center, a health center. If you see what the Africans did with this, this 60 bicycles, they are used to transport uh, pay, uh, 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 sick people in the forests because there are no streets, no cars can go through. Incredible. I'm sure you could you could not do this because you are not educated, you know. And this is what he wanted to say. They repair everything because they have no new things. Yeah, that's what I would like to add. Thank you very much for your active participation. Thank you very much.